Lahey, Parshal, Mosholder. Chapter 39, Edge of Apocalypse, the first book in the end series book, and there are three in all. At Liberty University, Mr. Jordan, perhaps you could answer that question. Cal Jordan had been busy sketching a picture on his notepad. He looked up with embarrassment to find the entire class staring at him. Sorry, Professor. I didn't hear it. There were muffled laughs from a few students ten rows back that echoed through the large college lecture hall. At the front of the class, the professor frowned and tried again. The question, Mr. Jordan, from one of your fellow classmates was why should Congress have the power to force a private citizen to testify in a congressional hearing? For a moment, Cal's brain froze. The professor studied Cal and then expanded his question. We're studying the powers of the Congress. Mr. Hitchney asked a salient question about the subpoena power of Congress. Cal turned around and looked ten rows back until he located the face of Jeff Hitchney, another student in the class. Hitchney, a tall blonde sophomore, had a twisted half-smile on his face. Cal now realized that the student had planted the question on purpose to embarrass him. Hitchney was the star pitcher on the college baseball team and was the leader of the school debate team. But there was one more thing. He had a keen interest in Cal's girlfriend, Karen Hester, and Hitchney seemed intent on harassing Cal. After all, oh, come on, how could Karen have preferred Cal over him? Mr. Jordan, the prof professor said, pressing in gently, I thought you might have some thoughts on the subject, considering the fact that your father, Joshua Jordan, is in the news on that exact issue. Cal cringed. There it is again, Colonel Joshua Jordan, the man who single-handedly rescued New York City from the perils of incoming nuclear missiles. Wherever I go, I can't escape my father. Now Cal struggled to focus and form an intelligent answer. He gave it his best shot. The power of Congress to conduct hearings sort of assumes, I guess, the power to conduct hearings for the good of the country. And that would assume, I suppose, the power to force people to testify. The professor gave a quick nod. Then he saw Hitchney's hand up again and called on him. Professor, it seems to me that Jordan's admitting then that his father is wrong and that Congress is right because he plainly suggested in his answer that the subpoena power is an appropriate exercise of the authority of the congressional committees. Hitchney capped it off with a smug grin. A few more chuckles from Hitchney's row. Cal's hand shot up. The professor recognized him. Yes, Mr. Jordan? Mr. Hitchney is correct that I'm admitting the power of Congress to support, to um, subpoena witnesses. But that's not what my father's case is about. 
what that case is about is the fact that Congress can't force someone to give away trade secrets and business intelligence, which is what they're trying to do. Plus, there's something else involved, too, the professor asked. And what is that? Sometimes people refuse to give information to Congress or a court, too, for good reasons. Last week, we studied this situation about media reporters who refused to testify in court about who their confidential sources were. They said they had a greater right to protect their news sources. And what is that greater right in your father's case? Cal paused. He now was in the interesting dilemma of having to defend his father's case. He wasn't hot on that idea. Plus the things that his mom and his sister Deborah had shared with him about his father's legal situation was strictly inner family matters, very private. But Cal had another overriding thought. On the other hand, there's no way I'm letting Hitchney off the hook. Okay, here's the deal. My father invented this laser weapon, the RTS return to sender thing. He never gave the government full ownership of his design. It was still in, well, like an experimental phase. Then the North Koreans launched missiles at us. The government used my dad's weapon to stop the missiles. Another student blurted out, Yeah! And you melted the North Koreans who may not have even been the attackers. And with that, a few students gave out a subdued boo. But the rest of the class started their own spontaneous cheer for Joshua Jordan. As the issue erupted all over the lecture hall around him, Cal was quietly staring at his hands in front of him. Man, I can't believe this. Why did the professor go into this stuff anyway? After the instructor brought the class back to order, he asked Cal to finish his thought. The point I was making is just this. If the government doesn't own the weapon, then shouldn't the businessman who invented it be able to protect his design? Hitchney shot up his hand and the professor nodded for him to speak again. Weapons involve national security. That doesn't belong to some multimillionaire businessman. Belongs to the government. Cal didn't wait to be called on. Um, we are the government, he said, turning back toward Hitchney. We studied that during the first week of this class. Hitchney didn't wait for the nod from the best professor this time. Why private citizen can't decide those kind of things? That would be chaos. The government's supposed to decide those issues. And what if some of the politicians in Congress aren't trustworthy? What if they let that weapon information slip into the wrong hands? Wow, talk about paranoid, Hitchney muttered to his friends sitting next to him, but loud enough for most of the class to hear. That's when the professor stepped back into the discussion. Okay, okay, good discussion. By the way, I love it when you students decide to exercise your gray matter. I think that's great. 
Then the professor turned to Cal again. Just wondering, Mr. Jordan, what's your major? Art? Well, if you ever get tired of art, you may want to think about pretty long. You raised some good points today. You might give some thought to joining the debate team, too. When he said that, the professor smiled and threw a smile up toward Jeff Hitchney, who was trying hard not to look threatened by that last comment. As the professor continued his lecture, Cal felt his all phone vibrate. He had set the vibrate mode on Morse code. Home was coded to vibrate dots and dashes for the word family, but calls from his father's office were set to vibrate out the code for SOS, the International Distress Signal. That was his own private joke. This time, it was the SOS. He wasn't going to take it, at least not right now, when the eyes of half the class were still glued on him. Back in his high-rise office in New York, Joshua Jordan was letting his call go through to his son on his speakerphone while he continued to scan a weapons design memo from his engineering team. The phone kept ringing. Joshua put the paper down. He's not going to pick it up. So he knows it's me calling and he's not picking up. Of course, he could still be in class. Take it easy, Joshua. Give the kid a break. When Joshua heard the start of his son's voicemail message, he thought about leaving a message, but bad news was best delivered person to person. He decided to hang up and Try him again in a few minutes. Joshua thought back to the call he just received from Rocky Bridger, a man whose fortitude was usually chiseled out of granite. But when Joshua had picked up his telephone call, his voice sounded different. Rocky started by saying, Josh, Rocky, Oh, man. His voice wavered. There was a long pause. Then a sound. Rocky's voice was breaking with emotion. What, what is it? Roger. My son-in-law. Murdered? Joshua. My God. He's gone. When Rocky collected himself and shared the slight information he had, the police were playing cloak and dagger with this, but the horrible bottom line was that Roger French was murdered in his office in downtown Philadelphia. The local police were being extremely tight-lipped about the details, though they'd mentioned that the FBI had some interest in the case. But his son-in-law was gone, the victim of a brutal crime, and now Rocky was with his daughter, who was in shock and was inconsolable. Joshua tried his best to comfort his, comfort his friend and mentor but he felt stupid and useless and clumsy. He'd immediately called Abby. He'd always been impressed with her sense of compassion, but this time her willingness to drop everything to go to Philadelphia to help the family was particularly heartwarming. Then something struck Joshua like a meteor <clears throat> Rocky just lost his son-in-law. <clears throat> Excuse 
excuse me, Rocky just lost his son-in-law to a senseless murder. Your life changes in a heartbeat. You can lose them so quickly. When was the last time I called Cal and told him that I loved him? Debbie and I don't have that issue. She's so upfront with everything, but Cal and I, things have always been up tight, strained. The clock keeps ticking. Nothing gets resolved. What if something happened to me and I didn't get a chance to smooth things out with Cal beforehand? Then when Joshua felt the overpowering need to call his son, he did. He tried again. And after a few nervous seconds, Cal picked up the call. Josh, this is Dad. Hi. How are you doing? Fine. Good. Look, I... I just heard some really bad news from a friend of mine. You know Rocky Bridger? Cal fell silent. Joshua added, The general from the Pentagon... Long-time friend of mine from the Air Force. Oh, yeah. Well, his son-in-law was murdered a couple of nights ago in Philadelphia. Rocky didn't have any details. Why would anyone want to kill Roger? I'm sorry to hear that, Dad. You and Mom mention Roger a lot, but I didn't know him well. Well, I got to thinking, and I just needed to call you. Okay. And? Yeah. Just tell you. There was a pause. I love you. Joshua wanted to elaborate somehow, but ended it there instead. Taken off guard, Cal could only mumble, Thanks, Dad. Sometime we need to talk, you and I. Okay. Man to man. All right. Cal was thinking to himself, what is this all about? But asking that was too risky. I mean, but what happened in New York? The day the missiles came, with you still being in the city. Cal was thinking, you mean so you can drill me about how I didn't tell you the truth about staying behind in Manhattan when my girlfriend Karen Hester, who you don't approve of? You mean we need to talk about that? I already admitted all of that to Mom. Can't you just let it go? That's when the conversation started drifting away like a rudderless sailboat. Finally, Joshua was the one who ended it. Okay, son. Just wanted a call. So goodbye. Cal was the last one to speak, and all he said was, goodbye. Then he clicked off his cell phone. Some students who had just been in his government class when he took off on Jeff Hitchney passed him by and called out his name and gave him the thumbs up sign. Cal smiled weakly and acknowledged them, but inside he was in turmoil. Chapter 40 the owner of the hardware and mining supply store in West Virginia was gingerly holding on to the box of explosives. He set it down cautiously on the counter. Then he pointed to the contents so his customer could take a look inside. The customer standing in front of him 
was a man in a flannel shirt with his sleeves cut off. He was wearing blue jeans and boots. The jeans looked new. He didn't recognize the customer. Which uh, mining operation did you say you're working at? Water coal, at as Zimler said, concocting the name instantly and doing a good imitation of a slow draw. It's a small mine, family owned, just, just opened up. Okay, okay, the hardware man said. So anyway, these uh, this solid pack Bridgewater type blast in caps. They detonate from an electric spark. Good. That's what I'm looking for. What are you using as your primary explosive? Simler grinned. He had no intention of telling him the truth. His primary was military-grade plastic explosives he'd already obtained on the black market for a pretty penny at a drop spot outside of Pittsburgh. All he needed now was a detonator. Blasting caps set off by an electric charge would be perfect. He'd already purchased the remote switches from an electronic shop. Rigging those up with cell phones to send the charge would be child's play for him. Primary explosives. Oh, the usual. Now these caps, they, they won't detonate by accident with static electricity in the air, right? Nope. Stray cell phone signals. That kind of thing won't do it? Nope. You have to send the electric charge directly to the cap for it to blow. Good. My attitude is, when you blast, you want to make sure that your target gets the full force. And only when you want it to go off. Timing is everything, right? Something hit the store clerk strange about the conversation, though he couldn't put his finger on it. Yeah, I, I guess so. Pulling out of one of bills, Zimler paid cash. Before the store owner handed over the box of blasting caps, however, he grabbed a clipboard and slapped it on the counter. We are supposed to get this from everyone who wants explosives. Got to put your John Hancock right here. Simler smiled and acted like he understood the phrase, but he hesitated for just an instant. He looked at the clipboard and noticed the signatures on it. You want me to sign here? That's the general idea. Simler signed a fake name. The shop over handed over the box. You be safe now. He said to Zimler. Of course, Zimler said as he took the bag with the box of blasting caps in it and then left the store. He'd taken a long detour to pick them up, but it was sure worth it. At one point in time when Zimler had been on his way to West Virginia to secure the blasting caps, He'd been going east on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. That was before he turned south toward the West Virginia border. And at that precise moment, Zimler was less than 50 miles away from the special agent John Gallagher's location. The FBI agent was still stuck in Philadelphia before returning to New York. He had one more stop to make, but it was a crucial one. 
He knew he had to face Miles Zatternack at FBI headquarters, but hours before he was due at the airport, he had received a call from the Philly police detectives. Surprisingly, the lead detective was good to his word and was calling him with some additional information about their investigation into the murder of Roger French. Agent Gallagher, we got something you might find interesting. I'm all ears. A video surveillance tape? From where exactly? Taken from the video camera in the lobby of the building where Roger French's insurance company had their offices? Oh, yeah, I do love Lobby surveillance video, Gallagher said with a bounce in his voice. There was a pause on the other end. The detective didn't know exactly how to respond to this wise-cracking FBI agent. Finally, he said, Come on over. We're in the viewing room. When Gallagher hung up, he suddenly felt as if he was seeing the light breaking in the distance. With any luck, Zimler would be ID'd on that tape. And if that happened, then Miles Zadernak would have to listen to him. Things were looking up. Chapter 41 in the lobby of Jordan Technologies Incorporated, the secretary had the deer-in-the-headlights look. Joshua had warned her that it could happen, but she still hadn't been, been prepared to come face-to-face -face with the U.S. Marshal holding a subpoena in his hand. Madam, do you hear me? I'm a United States Marshal. This is a legal document, and I have to deliver it to Mr. Joshua Jordan immediately. She glanced down at it. She caught the caption at the top of the document. By the authority of the Senate, the, the Congress of the United States of America, to Mr. Joshua Jordan. You are hereby commanded to appear. Secretary raised her eyes to the marshal and said, He's not here, sir. Where is he? I don't know. When is he coming back? I don't know. Young lady, <clears throat> you're coming very close to obstructing a federal marshal in the course of his official duties. You realize that? She swallowed hard before she answered. Look, like I said, Mr. Jordan had an emergency, had me cancel his appointments, and left. I don't know what else to tell you. The U.S. Marshal dropped his card on the desk. Here's my number. Call me the moment he gets in. The minute the marshal left the office, she called Joshua. He was in his limo, heading down the Boulevard of Americas in Manhattan. Joshua was on the line with Harry Smythe when the call came in, and he put Harry on hold. Mr. Jordan, a U.S. marshal just came in with those papers, and I said exactly what you told me to say, every bit, very good. I was a little nervous, though. Don't worry, I'm sure you did just fine. Joshua said goodbye, then clicked back to Harry. Well, just like you predicted, Harry, they were over at my office trying to serve me with the subpoena. Well, I think we need to just
face up to this, Josh, admit service. I'll accept service of the subpoena on your behalf at my office. Then I'll see what can be done legally. Harry, I want Abby's input on this. Is she there with you? No. She's up in Pennsylvania. She's helping out a family friend of ours. They had a personal tragedy. Same old Abby. Joshua asked Harry to stand by when he conferenced her in. When Abigail's cell phone rang, she was doing the dishes in the French house. While newly widowed Peg French was resting in her bedroom, Rocky Bridger was quietly playing with her and Roger's daughter. Abby, honey, it's me. How things are going? How are things going? Peg's finally resting. Josh, this is so terrible. Have they got any more details? Not much. They just said they have several theories. The police are being very secretive for some reason. But they did say one thing. What's that? That he wasn't just murdered. He was tortured before he was killed. Tortured? Yes. Who would have wanted to do that to Roger French? I can't think he would have been mixed up in anything sordid. He was a solid guy. No one can figure that out. And Rocky? He's putting up a brave front. You know him. He's focusing on Violet, Peg's daughter. Look, I'm, I'm sorry to throw this at you, but I've got Harry Smythe on the other line. I want to conference you in. Just as he thought, Senator Strayworth is going to the mat on the RTS issue. They've issued a subpoena. A U.S. Marshal was trying to serve it at my office, but I was out. Fine. Patch me in. Abigail said she wiped her hands off with a dish towel, then found a corner of the dining room where she couldn't be heard. After Joshua looped all three of them in, he spelled out the issue. Abby, Harry says we let them serve the subpoena, then try to find it out, fight it out in court. Abigail jumped in immediately. Harry, I assume you're going into D.C. federal court with a motion to quash the subpoena. Well, that's his strategy. I, I just don't want my position weakened by any delay in Josh accepting service of the subpoena from the marshals. Abigail was silent on the other end. Joshua knew she was digesting it. Then she spoke her mind. Henry, once Josh is served with the subpoena, the clock starts ticking. You then have to rush into court. What if you get the wrong judge and your motion is thrown out? Well, then the game's almost over. Josh either turns over all his RTS documents or he goes to jail. Those have pretty much been the two options all along. You know, Josh, he won't turn over those documents to Congress. He believes that our national security is too compromised on Capitol Hill right now. And if he goes to jail, his reputation, all that he's accomplished, will be tarnished and destroyed. The whole thing stinks, I know that. 
but I don't make the rules. Then maybe it's time to change the game. What are you thinking, baby? Joshua asked. Abigail shot back. Stall this thing. Stretch it out. We only need a few days. Days for what? Josh, when it comes to political battles like this, with Senator Strayworth, you're in my world now. I know something about that. Most of my practice has been representing senators, congressmen, even a stint in the White House counsel's office, as you know. Look, I respect you, Abby. Boy, did you do some great legal work on the Hill when you were practicing law. Cases before the Federal Communications Commission, other federal agencies, but Josh, you've got to listen to me on this. There are some people up there in Congress who want to destroy you, and they'll believe me if you start playing games like avoiding a subpoena. Harry, you're talking about enemies who want to destroy me. That sounds like war. And when it comes to military logistics, you're in my world. I don't intend to let a bunch of politicians destroy me. Which is why, Abigail said, we strike first. We hit back first. With what? Harry said, his voice now rising with a tinge of professional arrogance. The only hope is my motion to quash this subpoena. That's just one strategy. Frankly, Harry, I think you lose that motion. The backup strategy, Josh, is that we buy time just long enough to make sure that Phil Rankowitz has got the American Amera News launched. What are you talking about? A media project I'm working on. Something you can't have any involvement in, but Abby's right, that's our offensive. Abby said, if we keep the marshals from serving that subpoena on you, then we keep you out of jail just long enough for the American people to read the first issue of Amera News. Once they find out the truth, I'm betting they'll vent some outrage to their senators. And when that happens, I'm betting that Senator Strayworth and his buddies will start thinking about withdrawing that subpoena. Josh, really? Harry blurted out. I mean, talk about a long shot. But Joshua cut him off. Harry, I've made my decision. Here's the drill. I'm going to avoid being served with that subpoena. Go into hiding if I have to. Harry, can you still try to get a judge to throw it out? By not accepting service, you're putting me in a very uncomfortable position with the court. I'm not asking about your comfort. I'm asking if you can still try that legal maneuver if I'm not served the subpoena. After a moment's pause, Harry Smythe replied, Yes, I suppose I can. Good. Meanwhile, Abby... You and I need to make sure that American News gets launched ASAP. We need to get to the American public. That's our best hope. Harry Smythe wasn't going down without a fight. So you're simply rejecting my approach. My recommendation then? What I'm doing is going with Abby's plan instead. Then he added something else. When it comes to her advice, I'm willing to bank my life on it. Well, you may have to. 
Harry put it back in his lawyerly pessimism. You've got the federal government coming after your scalp. Chapter 42 Somewhere in Hamad Kachi's brain, all was not well. Even though all around him, the Asia blue seas of the Mediterranean were calm and sparkling, and a gentle four-knot wind was blowing. Kachi had been on the huge yacht of his partner, Caesar Demas, many times before. This was the first time, though, that Demas had used such a small crew. Only a captain, a first and second mate, neither of whom Catchy recognized, and two other fellows, the last two appeared to be pretty useless. They were thick-necked and muscular, looking more like bodybuilders or bouncers than sailors. The Pakistani-born arms dealer was afraid of boats. He might made no pretense of that. Was the general unpredictability of the sea that gave him unease. The undulating expanse constantly changing. He found the absence of the sight of land disconcerting as well as the fact that it contained living, teeming creatures under the surface. Things you can't see, but creatures that can eat you. Seated in a soft chair on the rear deck next to Caesar Demas, Kachi was trying to look relaxed. They'd been making small talk. Then Demas changed the subject. He wanted to discuss their plan to sell the RTS laser weapons technology as soon as Ata Zimler had obtained it. We've talked many times about our arrangements to sell off RTS. Yes, any news from our messenger? He's very close. At this point, he's virtually unstoppable. That's good to hear. So, we're still of one mind, you and I, that when we are in possession of the RTS design, we should sell it to a group of willing nations. No exclusive rights to just one nation, right? Don't we agree on that? Of course. Best way to maximize profit. Profit, yes, of course. Caesar Demas glanced around from one of the crew. Then he spotted one of the muscle guys sunbathing on the upper deck. He was wearing dress slacks, but had his shirt off. Giorgio, Demas called out. Get me a gin and tonic. Demas looked over at Catchy, but he said no. He didn't want anything except a glass of water. And by that time, Catchy was feeling slightly nauseous, maybe a bit seasick. After a few minutes, Giorgio came with the two drinks. There wasn't any ice in Kachi's water. A small thing. Kachi was going to ask this guy to fetch him some, but decided against it. So, Demas said, making a sudden right turn in the conversation, how was your trip to Moscow? Kachi was stunned. He hadn't told Caesar anything about the trip. Good, was all he said in response. The rolling sense of imbalance on the ship 
was now getting to catch her. He hoped he didn't vomit on the varnished wood deck of Caesar Demas's $90 million yacht. Kachi took a big gulp of water, but it didn't help. Caesar Demas was casually expecting the gently rolling blue sea all around, but he wasn't talking. Now Kachi was getting nervous. He felt as if he needed to give some explanation about the Moscow trip. If I don't explain, Caesar might think I just didn't consider it a big deal, which would be good. On the other hand, my silence might make him think I'm hiding something, which I am. Does Caesar know why I was there? Maybe he does, and he's just playing with me. That'd be just like Caesar. Why did I go on his yacht today? I could have come up with an easy excuse. Told him I was sick. That I don't like boats. Demas took a slow sip from his glass and wiped his lips. About the Moscow trip, Kachi finally said, I've always had an understanding with you. Oh? About doing small side deals myself. Small arms, nothing big. But you gave me the impression that wasn't a problem. Small weapons deals? Well, not a problem. Is that what Moscow was all about? Small arms? Yes, yes, it was. Selling to some time Russian thugs, I suppose. Small timers? Right? Little pocket change. <laughs> You know, to pay the electric bills. Ketchy tried to laugh, but it caught in his throat. Small arms. You know, AK-47s, rocket launchers. Hmm. I trust you're okay with that. Oh, yes, I, I would be okay with that. More silence. Then Demas glanced toward Giorgio, who Kachi suddenly noticed, had worked himself, his shirt still off, closer to them and was standing up. Then he was joined by the second muscle guy, who had a silly smile on his face. Both of the men had their hands in their pockets. They were looking at Hamid Kachi. The Moscow trip was successful for you? Demas asked. Oh, sure. Not a lot of money, but worth the trip, I suppose. Demas made a quit, quick, flooding gesture to the two men. Quick, almost indecipherable. The two men came up to stand on either side of Kachi. Please stand up, Demas said calmly to Kachi. Something wasn't clicking in Kachi's brain. In his business of trading in weapons of destruction and death, he should have recognized what was happening. The survival instinct should have kicked in, fight or flight. Except in this case, neither was an option and the brain was jamming. Get up on your feet, Hamad. Step on the mat. Looking down, Ketchy noticed the thick fabric mat in front of his chair. He also noticed a life vest lying on the deck. But the life vest was not orange. 
like the others he'd ever seen. It was blue, like the ocean, which was strange because someone wearing it wouldn't be noticed from the air. Kachi followed Caesar Damas's command and slowly rose, trying to come up with something clever to say, something to stop the clock from ticking, to stop the bad thing he vaguely felt in his inner gut that was about to happen. He tried to smile. On deck, calisthenics. But he couldn't finish his lame attempt at a joke. Before he could, the muscle guy with his shirt off had whipped a small handgun from his pocket and fired once into Kachi's thigh. The explosion of searing pain went through his mid-thigh. He screamed and collapsed on the mat. Caesar Dumas was still sipping from his glass. Then he bent forward toward Kachi, who was gripping his leg and moaning in pain. Who did you meet with in Moscow? I told you, some local gangs, small-time operators. This time the other guy, who was so muscled, pulled out his handgun, took aim and shot Catchy in the other leg. Catchy was pleading and screaming. Did you meet with anyone else? Catchy was unable to talk through the pain, but he was shaking his head and Demas gave a nod to the two fellows. The two guys strapped the streaming catchy into the life vest. Then they tossed him over the side, bobbing in the cold Mediterranean as the blood flowed out from the wounds in his legs. Kachi was still conscious. He could see Caesar Demas and the two muscle guys bending over the rails of the yacht. Demas yelled out to him, Just tell me, yes or no, did you agree to sell the RTS to Vlad Levko in Moscow? Agree to give Russia exclusive rights to the RTS? Just nod your head up and down if you can't talk, if you tell the truth, we'll pull you in. Fix up your legs. Kachi nodded his head up and down. Then a thought flashed through Kachi's mind. I'm in the sea. Sharks! I'm spilling blood! It was as if Caesar Demas could read his mind. Oh, no need to worry about sharks. I read an article by a marine biologist that say they're very rare in the Mediterranean. Half a minute went by, but Demas made no attempt to pull the men into the yacht. Ketchy tried to yell out, but didn't have the strength. He tried to lift an arm to get their attention, but it felt as if it were filled with cement. Then he saw something out of the corner of his eye, something moving in the water to his left. But Demas and his two guys saw it first, and they had a better view. It was a blue shark, its fin cutting the water toward Ketchy was maybe four or five feet long. Caesar Demas's last words to Hamad Kachi were, I guess I need to tell that marine biologist he was wrong. Kachi felt a collision 
with his leg like he'd just been hit by a car. Then another hit. Now Hamad Kachi was being pulled down under the water. He was fully in the jaws of the blue shark and it was wagging him back and forth. The currents of blue water above him and the frothing bubbles from his own silent underwater screams were the last thing Hamid Kachi saw before everything went dark. Chapter 43 Harry Smythe knew the stakes in this case were as high as any he'd ever handled. In Washington, D.C., in courtroom number 12 of the United States District Court of the District of Columbia, Harry was sitting at the counsel's table. At the other table were his opponents, two assistant U.S. attorneys. They would be arguing the case on behalf of Congress. If Harry lost his motion for an emergency order striking down the subpoena issued by Senator Strayworth's committee, he would have only one tactic left. He could try to get the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit to take it up and issue an emergency stay against enforcement of the subpoena. But that was a stretch. So his only real chance was right here in the courtroom of federal judge Olivia Jenkins. Yet there was a sadly inevitable feeling of doom in the pit of his stomach. His arguments would be novel, too novel. Judge Jenkins didn't like exotic contentions. She liked to decide cases when the issues were clear, when ordinary applications of subtle law were involved. This case was anything but ordinary. The suit that Smythe had filed argued that the court should quash a subpoena issued by a congressional committee, a subpoena that was clearly within that committee's jurisdiction. Smythe heard the door open from the inner chambers behind the bench. The bailiff strode in, followed by the court clerk, who slapped the court file on the judge's bench. Then the court reporter followed last. Less than a minute later, Judge Olivia Jenkins entered the courtroom, and the lawyers jumped to their feet. The rest of the courtroom was empty. The government had secured an order from the judge, clearing visitors and bystanders and barring the media on the grounds of national security. Jenkins was an attractive middle-aged black woman with a reputation as a smart, no-nonsense judge. She glanced through the file and then called the case. Harry Smythe stood up to the podium and offered his arguments. There were only two main points. First, that the RTS design belonged to Joshua Jordan, not the government. It was a matter of patent law and intellectual property rights. Congress had no right to force disclosure of weapons designs that were trade secrets and belonged to a private citizen. Besides, Smythe argued, Joshua Jordan had no qualms about testifying to the select committee 
and it answered all of their questions. The only line in the sand that he drew was his refusal to produce highly sensitive documents for the design of the RTS weapon to members of Congress. Judge Jenkins asked the assistant attorneys to weigh in. The first government lawyer was pressed. Look, the contract that the Pentagon had with Mr. Jordan states, Your Honor, that when the weapon was officially accepted by the United States, it would become the property of the United States. Mr. Jordan signed away any special rights he had to the RTS design. Harry Smythe shot back. But the RTS system was still experimental. It was never officially accepted by the United States government. You're wrong, the government attorney countered. When the U.S. government used the RTS weapon to turn back incoming missiles and used it, Your Honor, with Mr. Jordan's permission and participation, I might add, that was the same as accepting the weapons for purposes of the contract. Judge Jenkins made short work of that argument. I'm not convinced that Mr. Jordan retained any private rights to the RTS weapon design, at least as against the United States of America. He can protect his patent against other private citizens, but not against Congress, which is an arm of the U.S. government, Mr. Smythe. You've lost on that one. Smythe then launched into his second point. The judge would Jordan had a concern about the ability of the Congressional Committee to keep the RTS weapon design information secret. That committee had already leaked information to the press. Smythe said, losing his characteristic professional calm. His face was beginning to get flushed as he spoke with an angry passion. How can we assume that it will not allow the leaking also of the sensitive weapons information? Mr. Smythe, argument concerns me as well, the judge said, motioning to the government lawyers to respond. The second assistant attorney strode to the podium to address that point. Well, it seems to me that we could agree on steps to be taken that would ensure the super secrecy of this RTS information. That's once Mr. Jordan discloses it, of course. Judge Jenkins turned to look at Harry Smythe. Harry had the premonition already what the judge was going to do. It was all too, un too reasonable, too practical a solution for the judge not to jump on it. Mr. Smythe, what do you say about that? Judge Jenkins said, we do confidentially procedures all the time in contested subpoena cases. Had Mr. Jordan produced the documents to this court, I'll have some restrictions on the committee that hopefully they will agree to. Then everybody's happy, right? But Smythe knew somebody wouldn't be happy. He knew that Joshua Jordan had no intention of divulging his RTS design for the eventual use or misuse by a group of politicians. Smythe braced himself as he began to
to share the bad news. Your Honor, I doubt that your creative solution will work. And why is that? Harry was about to pull the pin in the hand grenade. Because Mr. Jordan is not inclined to comply with the subpoena. He won't divulge his RTS technology except to the Defense Department under conditions where he has some guarantee that it won't be used for political purposes and that it won't be shared with other nations. There was a different look now on Judge Schenken's face. No longer the mediator, the conciliator looking for a compromise among the parties. Now it was the aggravated judge who had the power to level judgment. The government, in their response papers, says that Mr. Jordan is deliberately avoiding service of the subpoena. Is that true? They've been unable to serve him, Your Honor. That's not what I asked. Is your client willing to admit service on the subpoena? No, Your Honor, he isn't. So Mr. Jordan is in defiance of Congress. He's defying an official subpoena. I wonder, Mr. Smythe, if he will also be in contemptuous defiance of this court, Your Honor. As you know, the government has asked me as part of this proceeding to issue an order that Mr. Jordan produce his RTS data and failing that to be held in contempt of court and to be sent to jail until he complies. Now, Mr. Jordan is ordered to produce his RTS documents to this court. Are you saying that he will disobey my order? Smythe now had to do a quick legal dance. Your Honor, with all due respect, you're asking me to commit my client to a hypothetical future situation. The fact is, you haven't yet ordered my client to produce his RTS documents. We only have the congressional subpoena. Well, I'm ordering it now. Your client has exactly 48 hours to turn over these documents to this court. Failing that, I will consider and will probably order his indefinite incarceration in a federal detention jail. And you'd better tell your client he's in deep water right now. I hope he knows how to swim. Soon as Harry Smythe pushed his way through the reporters milling around in the hallway outside the courtroom and yelled, no comment, to those peppering him with questions, he found a quiet corner and he called Joshua. Josh, we've been shot down by the judge. Abby said we'd probably lose. The judge ordered you to produce your RTS documents within 48 hours. Or, or federal marshals put out a warrant for your arrest. Then they will haul you in for processing, take your mug shot, remove your personal effects for safekeeping, and do a strip search. Then they'll put you in a jail cell. What's your next move? Appeal it, but don't count on a favorable result. 
more important, Josh. What's your next move? What I always do when enemy fire is incoming, keep my head down and my finger on the trigger. <laughs> what a guy, Joshua Jordan. What a family, Abigail, Cal, and Darlene. Is it Darlene? I don't know. I, it's a sweet family. Anyway, I'll be back. You can bet on it. For tomorrow, and chapter 44.